Adam was uh, walking around the Garden of Eden feeling very lonely. So God asked him, what's wrong with you? Adam said he didn't have anyone to talk to. God said he was going to make Adam a companion and that would be a woman. He said the person will gather food for you, cook for you, and when you discover clothing, she'll wash it and even iron it for you. She will always agree with every decision you make. She will bear your children and never ask you to get up in the middle of the night to take care of them. She will not nag you and will always be the first to admit that she was wrong when you had a disagreement. Adam asked God, how much will a woman like this cost? God replied, an arm and a leg. Adam asked, well, what can I get for a rib? And the rest is history. You're a much better audience than the eight o'clock, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, you know, my wife, Pat, sometimes accuses me of living in an alternative universe. And I'm not sure if, you know, some of you would agree with me, but actually, sometimes it's a very nice place to be. <laughs> not recalling the conversation we had sort of 20 minutes ago. Being able to multitask. Ignoring your wife while reading the paper, watching the sport on TV and sleeping at the same time. <laughs> it is a very comfortable place to be in an alternative universe. But this is the rub, and this is the serious bit. The church is in an alternative universe. It is not in the same universe as this world. It's a place where we feel comfortable. We don't want to change. We don't want to do things that will uh, alter our feeling of relaxation and confidence. It's a, a place in which we have to move from. I, each year um, we get a, a load of statistics from the diocese. And it covers everything. It covers everything from, um, you know, how many baptisms, how many weddings, how many people come to church on Christmas Day, and, and you know, you know, people that we consider members of the church. But one of the, the, the really um, um, telling things is, is the number of identifiable givers. That's the people that give on a regular basis. So, those are the people that I guess we would call members of the church. Well, I, I arrived in 2007, so that was the first set of figures that uh, I, I received. And we just received the figures for 2014. We well, have a shot in the dark. In seven years, I'll, I'll tell you now that the number of identifiable givers has gone down. It's not gone up. Throw me a percentage. How, how, how much do you think has gone down in seven years? Not long, seven years, is it? This, and this is not for our church. This is for the deanery of Essex. That's all the, the churches uh, in the Essex area, all the Anglican churches. Well, that's a pretty good guess. Someone's been looking at the figures. <laughs> 35 percent, it was 34. A third, a third, you know, there comes a time, Bill was saying that, you know, we need a crisis to react to, to something. We're coming to that point where we've got to do something serious. And it's about taking a step of faith. You don't have to jump off the cliff. <laughs> we have to take a step of faith. 
You know, we gather today to give thanks for all the wondrous things that, that God has given us. And boy, are we fortunate here in Canada. And I don't want to hear anybody here say they haven't been to vote. <laughs> you know, democracy is a wonderful gift that God has given us here. And there are people in this world, millions, who bite off our right arm to have that, have that right to vote. We are so blessed here in Canada. The problem is, there's a lot of the gifts that God gives us, we don't use. Of course, I'm talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And why don't we use them? Because we're afraid. We're afraid if we give our whole life to God, give our lives over to Christ, and something's going to change, we're going to be different, we're not going to like it. <laughs> but that's what we need to do. You'll all remember these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free. Many in our church do this in a very practical ways. You know, the, Cro uh, the Out of Cold program, supporting street help, supporting generously many projects, too many to mention here this morning. But the workers are few, and the labourers are tired. But it's simply to expand the kingdom, which we need to do. We need to get out there with the great unwashed and share what Jesus Christ has, has done in our lives. And the reality is, is that people out there are desperate to hear the good news. The problem is, is that the established church has no credibility out there. And that's the truth. I mean, if, just ask people, if you don't, don't take my word for it. Ask people that don't go to church why they don't go to church. And most times they'll tell you, oh, they're full of hypocrites. <laughs> they don't practice what they preach. That's because, for many of us, we really need Jesus Christ to be the centre of our lives. Put it bluntly, for us to be able to get out there, because I'm not a great one for bums on seats. That, that, that doesn't uh, give you an idea of the health of a church. You can have a church full of people, but it doesn't mean to say that it's a healthy church. <coughs> Excuse me. It's about the heart, about changing the heart. That's the sign of a healthy church. And we need to do some radical surgery. If we don't do some radical surgery on the patient, the patient will die. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to work out. If we've lost 34% in seven years, you can't blame it all on me. <laughs> Where's the Anglican Church going to be in 15 years' time? What about young Jack? Wherever young Jack is. Yeah, where, where's he going to worship? You know, we, we've, got a, we've got a responsibility. It's not just about us coming to church. It's not about us. It's, uh, it, it, it's about, I um, can't remember his name, Archbishop Temple. He said, the church is the only organisation 
that exist for the people that are not yet members. And we forget that. We think it's all about us. It's not. Our gospel reading tells us this morning something we find very difficult not to do, and that is not to worry. The passage talks about not worrying about food, drink, clothing, or any other such necessities. But it's important to realize it doesn't mean that we should not provide and work for these things. We should. The passage, though, addresses the problems associated with the anxiety about these things. Anxiety is debilitating and affects the ability of the church to work for the glory of the kingdom. The passage tells us that focusing on God's kingdom will take away the worry and the anxiety. In other words, we need to trust God completely. Let the Holy Spirit work in our lives. Remember that story earlier on in the service about Jack hanging onto that branch? We need to let go. It's not about falling off the edge of the cliff, it's taking one small step. Our New Testament reading tells us that God wants people to be saved, to come into the truth, to the knowledge of Christ. It has to be acknowledged that the way we are doing church today must do it and cut mustard. I've quoted him before, but I'll quote him again. Bishop Terry. Bishop Terry said uh, a few years ago, our liturgy is not scratching where people are itching. We need to do things differently. Whether it be church in a cafe, church in a pub, church in the street. But we need to get people in here and change people's hearts. Because the workers are few. The workers are knackered. Put it bluntly. No point messing around, Hazel, is there? Let's be, yeah, yeah, straight to it. It's what you understand. In Jesus' name, amen.